Thank you for joining us. My name is Johanna Buya, and I'm the Senior Transportation Editor at Recode. Today we're going to be talking about urban reimagination. A lot of you guys have been spending time in panels talking about Smart Nation. Um, today we're going to be talking about sort of how we get there, the challenges that we face to get there, and the people who are driving that change. Joining me today, we have <coughs> Tim Greisinger, the VP of Cognitive Solutions at IBM, Esteban Rodolfo, um, the Executive Manager at Mobile World Capital Barcelona, Naveen Kumar, he has a very long title, Entrepreneur Impact Program Manager at Autodesk, Andrew Chow, the President of ST Electronics, and John Vidler, the Director of Solutions Marketing at Huawei. So in lieu of a formal introduction, I'm asking, sort of a, doing a lightning round, I want to go down the line and ask each of you to talk a little bit about, or in one brief sentence, tell us what your company does with regards to urban reimagination, and one specific example of a pro product or program that you guys are working on that relates to that. Tim? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Tim Greisinger. I, as, as she uh, said, I'm look, currently looking after our, our cognitive solutions, but I, I previously spent uh, um, many years running IBM Smarter City programs across 150 countries, uh, and uh, so both working here in Smart Nation as well as globally. I think one example that locally has some uh, relevance is the work we did with, S uh, with uh, Starhub and, and SMRT uh, and an LTA to use advanced analytics to, uh, to look at the situation awareness of what happens when the trains break down, where are the people, where do they want to go, how to, how to alleviate some of the congestion that happens. Uh, and that was a, a joint research collaboration, I think, that uh, is quite relevant here. Um, I am uh, from the Mobile World Capital Barcelona. It's a public foundation. Our objective there is uh, to make Barcelona smarter, smarter and also to boost the digital transformation in corporations and SMEs uh, with the idea to make the citizens' life better. One example of this would be the project that we have developed for the tourism uh, industry. It's a big data project uh, that connects the different corporations in Barcelona, and it allows uh, not only to give the tourists a better experience uh, uh, in order for them to take profit of the city itself, but also it boosts the business of the corporations involved, and it allows it for a better uh, co uh, cohabitation between uh, tourists and citizens, which is a big deal. Uh, in a city like Barcelona, where we are four uh, million uh, habitants, uh, we receive more than seven million tourists e every year. So this could turn out to be a problem, but because of this solution, we are finding uh, really uh, ways to solve it. Seven million, that's more people than there are in Singapore. Yes. And that's just tourism. That's oh, tourists wow. every year. Oh, wow. Naveen. Seven million, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, morning. So um, I'm from Autodesk. For those of you who might not know of Autodesk, uh, we are the world's leading 2D and 3D software design company, um, primarily in uh, three sectors, architectural, engineering, and media entertainment. Uh, specifically for me, I run the uh, Entrepreneur Impact Program worldwide. Uh, the program basically assists startups, uh, innovators, entrepreneurs that are creating solutions that have a positive impact, either environmental or social. Um, we give up to $150,000 worth of software for free for three years, and we also support them with training, um, co-marketing, and also telling their stories worldwide, basically empowering them to imagine, design, and create a better world. That's about it. Great. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Chow. I'm from ST Electronics. Uh, basically, ST Electronics is a system house in Singapore, and uh, we have been providing an uh, innovating system solution uh, in Singapore and also around the regions. Uh, many things you see in Singapore actually uh, came out from all these uh, innovations, like for example, the EMAS on the roads, the, the taxi booking systems, the, uh, and uh, even public safety, uh, health care, and uh, a lot of uh, e-government solutions that we, we provide them in Singapore. Yeah. John. Thanks, Andrew. John Vidler from Huawei here. Um, so I guess Huawei being Huawei, what we have to talk about is communications, and, and that we see that as our, one of our key functions within the smart city ecosystem. We're all about the, the innovation and open collaboration that that uh, communication layer can provide to people. So the same mass market, broad scale communications that we saw around the world that changed the world with the GSM phones that we all carry in our pockets now is what we're trying to deliver 
uh, at the moment in the smart city area. And I would be uh, remiss if I didn't mention the uh, narrowband IoT standard that we are at the forefront of pushing. So this will provide that same communications and innovation layer that will enable third-party devices, third-party device makers and vendors to deliver uh, the same device anywhere around the world and connect it anytime and any, in any way they want to do it. Great. And so before we go dig a little bit deeper into each thing that you guys are working on, I'd like for you to sort of help me unpack the concept of a smart city. What does the city of the future, the ideal city of the future, look like in 20, 30 years? Where are we working? Where are we living? How are we getting to work? And how are we communicating? Any one of you can answer, you can raise your hand, whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> I would just uh, jump in that uh, you know, the ultimate way to define a city is from the citizen's point of view mm -hmm. out. Uh, to have everything serve the citizen, to make living in that city for that person better than living anywhere else that they could do for their, their career, their, their life, their family, for their safety, for their health, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for their stability. So you know, I think the, it's, it's everything you can do. Uh, the ideal city is to have the p perfect place for a citizen to live. And that leaves sort of a lot of interpretation for well, each city. Yes, every city has to solve the problems that keeps that city from being the perfect place to live. Right. Uh, and that varies by country and by, by environment. Some places have more crime. Mm -hmm. uh, some places have more natural disasters. Right. Uh, here in Singapore, it's more advanced, clearly. And so yeah. it's, it's the higher order things you can do for citizens uh, that can make life better, uh, you know, dealing with aging, uh, chronic disease, mm -hmm. uh, you know, fostering you know, new kinds of uh, careers with entrepreneurism. You know, all these things are different city by city. Definitely. And so Barcelona is, is highly connected as well. And so, I mean, outside of Barcelona, are there cities that are as connected as, as them? Well, of course, uh, I mean, uh, in uh, Spain itself, uh, we have a good, very good example. For example, Valencia is doing a great job mm -hmm. trying to become smarter, uh, as well as Bilbao. And, and Madrid is a little bit behind, but they are getting there. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is just for Spain, but in Europe, uh, you can talk about uh, London is making huge efforts to improve their transportation system. Right. Uh, Paris is doing a great job into everything that uh, utilities. So I think uh, the effort is clear. All the cities need to go smarter, smarter, not only to make citizens' life easier, but also to control costs, to be more effective, right. and in order also to position themselves towards an industry or another. I mean, the tech industry itself, it's a very interesting mm -hmm. industry to, to position yourself as a city, to attract talent into that, uh, and becoming a smarter is part of it. I mean, who would like to develop a startup in a city that is completely antique? Yeah. Uh, it's better to be in a connected city, evidently. Definitely. And so if I close my eyes, what city, what, what, what when I walk out the street in, not Singapore, because Singapore is sort of an anomaly in a lot of in a lot of ways. But maybe another city in Asia. I know I close my eyes. I walk out, the, uh, walk onto the street into this smart city. What street am I walking onto? What is how is it different than what what it looks like today? What cars are passing me by, or what what does a public transportation system look like? And I know that you guys all work on different digital initiatives and using data to better inform these decisions. And so, what does that look like in the long term? Uh, m maybe I, I, I share some of the concept on transportation. Uh, we, in Singapore context, we are, we are a very small country, right? We are, we are only 700 square kilometers, uh, much smaller than some of the cities that you come from. 12% uh, of our land mass is actually used for roads, and we, we cannot build more roads in Singapore, right? So we have to use technology to make sure that we have smooth transportation because uh, if you get stuck in the jams, you get stuck in the, on the train, you know, and uh, that's, that's a very strong economy impact to Singapore. So we have to use uh, technology to make uh, traffic smart. So we are pushing choices to you, right? So one of the concepts we are pushing is uh, multimodal travel, right? What does it mean, right? When you, when you take a train, and the moment you come down from the train, you know how many people are in the taxi queues, you know how many people are waiting for the bus, and you know when the, the next bus will come or, or leave, right? So, so this is where how we're going to use the technology and sensors to push information down to you. And of course, uh, uh, as you are aware that we are in Singapore, we are pushing the next generation electronic road pricings. 
And uh, it's not just a charging but a, a mechanism, but it's actually literally pushing information to you. So that is to say that uh, when come year 2019, we can track every single vehicle where they are and so that we can, we can, we can actually can uh, sort of have dynamic uh, charging on the roads. You pay what you drive. And uh, so this is where how to, the end of the day, we're actually trying to make uh, congestion smooth in Singapore. Right. So this is where we uh, employ technology to make traffic smart. Yeah. And so, so how are, sorry, go on. Sorry, to build on what yeah. Andrew was just saying, I think uh, when you think about what cities will be like in the yeah. future, uh, especially a smart city, it will be a much more friendly place. Yeah. So the nature of that friendly space, that friendly place will change radically. And when I say friendly, what I mean is, in many cases, what we've created are these soulless concrete jungles that we all live in. Um, the smart cities of the future uh, enable those concrete jungles to, to just be uh, better for your soul. Right. They make you feel better. They make you function better. They make you work more efficiently. They make you play better. They give you better relationships with everyone around you. Uh, they enable you to educate your children more effectively. Mm. It's, a, it's a better, more friendly, in quotations, place to live, I think. Definitely. And so just to go back to what you were saying, I mean, you guys will now or soon have a satellite that sort of tracks every car and, and charge you per mile or something like that. How have consumers been reacting to that? The, I, I think the, uh, we, you see, the, the question of smart city it's not about deploying the latest or the most sexy technologies available. Today, many of these technologies are available. But in Singapore context, uh, we are saying that uh, smart city is to make our life easier, yeah. our life uh, more efficient. Uh, you, have, you, have, you have choices to make because information are pushed to you. And all these are available because of uh, things are happening like internet of things, big data, robots. And, and, and so this is where consumer will feel that living in Singapore is really smooth, it's really mm -hmm. efficient, right? So we are, we are solving problems that we face today through technologies, and that is the notion of smart city. Then. Right, so the larger benefit sort of outweighs any yes. other. Great. Um, and so Singapore, again, is you know, an anomaly in many, many ways, particularly given that the, the public and the private sector work very closely together when it comes to implementing innovation and technology. Yeah. But on a city-to-city -city basis, are you seeing, given that you guys are all part of global companies, are you seeing that governments and city governments are actively seeking innovative solutions to existing problems, or rather that they're trying to catch up to new innovation and new technology. I think self-driving cars are, is one sort of interesting topic um, related to that, but what are you guys seeing? Well, I, I think it's the, uh, the former. I, I, I think most cities uh, and governments don't have the money to do anything other than solve the biggest problems first, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for political interests as well as just the stability of, of the economy. Right. And, and so it's, we find that the definition of smart city, uh, again, means something to every city based on what they need to solve. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in some places, it is crime and, and safety. Uh, in some places, it's, uh, you know, it is the transportation issues that are more uh, pressing in places like Jakarta and Manila than it is even yeah. here. Uh, and, and, and so it all depends. Energy, you know, uh, there's places where energy is a huge uh, uh, issue for the country. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so in Dubai, for instance, that's an issue because right, they right, get desalinated. Right. It's the whole ecosystem impact of energy. Uh, and so it, it's solving that initial problem. I don't think many cities have the luxury of, you know, of, of creating an a agenda that is trying to solve, look for problems to solve because they're innovative. Right. Uh, it's nice to have, but uh, you have to solve the problems pressing first. I, I, I would add, I completely agree with you, it's just that I think that it's important to, have a, uh, to build a dialogue between government and corporations, because sometimes the people in the government, they are not aware of the possibilities of certain solutions. Mm -hmm. So having this bridge, which is what we do in the mobile world capital, is building this bridge between the private and the public part is uh, what enables the government to decide, okay, I have this problem and I know this technology exists or this solution might be and start working on it. If not, sometimes you know the problem but you have no idea on which way to go. So uh, having this constant dialogue, these platforms where people meet and talk about possible solutions is extremely important, such as events like this, yeah. uh, all the events where you can expose all the possibilities uh, surrounding any industry. 
Great. And so, so, so what are, I mean, costs are obviously a huge factor in this, but what are some other challenges that cities face when they're thinking about implementing? Let's say they have this ambition to be incredibly innovative and incredibly smart city. What are the other challenges that they face? Sorry, what was the one? What's the? Sorry. What was the question? I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are the other, maybe this mic isn't loud enough, but what are the, the other challenges other than cost that cities face when they want to implement innovation? Uh, so I'm going to echo what you said earlier that you know every city has a different challenge. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to India, there is a different challenge in Mumbai compared to Bangla uh, compared to Bangalore. Um, but there is a convergence of where public sector and private sector are working together. So mm -hmm. I give you an example. So I met uh, a, a company, basically is a husband and wife uh, design company. And what the government uh, in Chennai has done is this, they've given them an intersection in one, in one part of town, and they've actually asked them to input their ideas on how to make it more sustainable and also to manage the traffic situation over there. So they have license to a certain degree to implement their solution for that intersection. Oh, wow. Yeah, so if that proves to be a success, whether it manages the traffic flow or even the... Um, traffic light situation because sometimes it breaks down. If they can do that correctly or properly, they can implement that into many other locations as well. So that's one small example of how an entrepreneur or innovator working with the government and a private sector coming together to solve one small challenge in one small part in Chennai. Right. In a very yeah. lean way. Sorry? In a very lean way. I mean. In a very lean way. So to that, I had a conversation with them and I mentioned that there is a startup that is actually trying to harness energy from, um, in India, they call it speed breakers. I mm -hmm. think they call it humps here, right? The humps where you slow down. Speed bumps in the US. Speed bumps, there mm -hmm. you go. It's called speed bumps in the US. Um, so what they're trying to do is actually harness kinetic energy from the movement of the car over the oh, speed hump. Funny. Use that to generate electricity to power the traffic light and also to power the street lights in that coordinate. So that solves, again, a small challenge. So if they implement that in that intersection, yeah. that not only powers the light in that cross-section, but it also probably might even send back um, electricity back to the main grid. So these are the you know, kind of ideas that is happening over there. So um, the notion of smart nation, I, I think personally, is still very loose. Yes. There's a lot of room for adding and extrapolating from that. Definitely. So, so if, I, if I may add in Singapore context, uh, how do we actually go about implementing this smart nation from the, the government and public, uh, private sector context? Now, the, the government actually has set up a smart nation program office reports, reporting directly to the prime minister office. Now, basically what we are doing is that our ID is trying to lay an a island-wide infrastructure uh, across the whole Singapore. Right, uh, so that all this, uh, and we started to have, uh, we built the data centers, collecting data, and we have uh, AG boxes, what you call the uh, aggregate gateway boxes. So you're going to start to see some of these uh, AG boxes uh, uh, growing up in Singapore. And what does it mean that this is connected to a core backbone? Uh, so once this, this, this framework is laid out, the other agencies will come in, right? The environment will pr plug in their sensors to the AG box. The, the, the police will put in maybe their, their sensors or cameras, and uh, even uh, other agencies, will, the town council will put in some of their devices inside. So the question is that to really make a smart nation smart, you really have to lay the infrastructure, and this is what we are doing. And after doing all these things, then of course, uh, there's a lot of pilots come in, projects, pilot projects come in, and uh, when the pilot projects come in, where the big companies like IBM, MMCs will come in to participate. You know, we can have uh, Singapore SMEs, we have uh, the startup to come and participate. So this is how we we relay the infrastructures and start to grow all the, all the various pilots Definitely. for smart nations. It, it, let, I mean, I, I think it's also interesting, even if you take one problem, a statement like water, mm -hmm. and, uh, and especially for entrepreneurs here in Singapore, to appreciate that the definition of a water problem or a traffic could mean something so different to every city. Right. Yep. If I can just mention like th a couple of examples, uh, you know, like we, we're, uh, you know, IBM did this project in Hong Kong to uh, look at where the, predict with analytics th by using pressure, where the 3% leakiest pipes are in the right. city every year to proactively fix them by using pressure anal analytics. As we were talking before, I, I took that idea to India to only learn that I was ignorant of how uh, most cities in India don't have pressurized water systems. Right. And, and yet the problem there is equitable distribution of water where you know, we use analytics to equally give water to 7 million people in Hyderabad through mm -hmm. uh, distribution. 
the problem in Australia is not that, it's conservation of water. So how do you use demand side management to, to constrain the use of water? Uh, in, uh, in Ningbo, the issue is pollution. Right. The water in the reservoir is clean, the water that's coming into the, into the sea is dirty, and it's creating uh, a social unrest and, 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 and social ill. Yeah. Uh, how do you solve that? Uh, Miami, you know, they were able to find the leakiest systems in the park district and take a million dollars out of their four million dollar budget every year and redirect it to social programs. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, one that's a little bit more of the stage of Singapore is the Netherlands, which is a, a nation that's under, under sea level, uh, that spends its life keeping the water out, but at the same time, if they pump too much out, they can't uh, sustain agriculture. Right. And so how do you have a national cloud that integrates all water data into an innovation platform, mm -hmm. as opposed to having 70 independent water projects in the nation? All, you know, that, the topic is water, which is you know, fundamentally, you know, as much as energy and traffic, a city issue. Uh, but to every one of those cities, it means something different. And so I guess, you know, as, as you innovate on uh, whatever space you're looking at here, it's not just the, so you have to think about how, what solution you're building is interpreted and needed in different parts of the market. Right. So sort of a hyper-local approach to a global solution. Yeah. Great. And so there's, a, there's an audience question here that I actually wanted to ask as well. But, you know, as we innovate and create these smart nations, and I know that there's sort of an idyllic version of what a smart nation is, and then there's the opposite where you're sort of just innovating and trying to solve specific problems. But in places like San Francisco, New York, Vancouver, all these places that are constantly innovating, you know, that drives costs up, that drives the cost of living up. How do our smart nations, this, this ideal version of a smart city, is it affordable for middle and lower income? If not, how do we make it so that we're not forcing people out of the places that they've lived in for so long? Well, I, I do think that uh, becoming smart, of course, it implies an investment, mm -hmm. but it doesn't imply the, uh, more cost if well done. It's uh, on the contrary, uh, a well-implemented program on a smart city uh, it lowers the cost of the of the development of, of any activity. For example, we were talking about water or traffic or parking. Uh, any of these cities have huge problems with that, and they spend a humongous uh, quantity of money uh, trying to cope with it. If they become, if they uh, find a smarter solution, they can really reduce cost and then investment in invest that in other things. So it's. Uh, I think that becoming smarter is not what gets prices up. Uh, of course, the, the quality of life goes up. Yes. And uh, then become other products that are more sophisticated because the uh, quality of life is better. Right. But it's not about becoming smarter that's uh, really um, levering up the, the prices in any city. Uh, in fact, we have the proof in Barcelona. We, we have a program on traffic control, trying to reduce the cars. So they started, uh, uh, the city council uh, started using uh, an app that was a startup from France, a mm -hmm. very good one, Blah Blah Car is called, right. uh, for car sharing. Uh, and uh, suddenly they found out they weren't really pushing enough for people to use it. So they uh, connected with the parking problem. Mm -hmm. If you use the Blah Blah Car, you had to reduce fare on the parking. Uh, so it, it gives you back to uh, suddenly they notice that they reduce a lot their spends in, in parking. Also that the, the communication effort that they were doing to implement that was done through the users itself. It becomes right. viral. Uh, and all because they changed their mindset to a systemic view. Mm -hmm. Not only they were trying to cope with the problem of too many cars and they connected with the parking car and now they're talking about the cultural change in the transportation. So they're trying to see everything in, in, as a group, as a total. Uh, that will bring a, a huge cost reduction right. to the city. So you see cost going up not so much a symptom of a smart nation, but rather in some cases a side effect and something that's not, it doesn't have to happen yeah. if you do it intelligently. I think it's, an, it's a long run to yeah. become a smart city. If you uh, watch it in the short run, because of the investment, probably it's very expensive. Right. But uh, a city is supposed to stay forever. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it in the long run, it's really good. The, the problem here is that politicians work with <laughs> short terms. Yeah. So here's the, the battle. So I think you can possibly spin it a little bit if you're talking about affordability as an issue for engagement. Right. 
with a smart city, mm -hmm. you could change your definition of the smart city. You could say, what does a smart city offer the entrepreneurs, the developers, the innovators that, that I can give them using another mechanism? Can we change the definition of a smart city to mean access to those smart city resources, those smart city opportunities for funding and development and, um, and manpower? Can we give those and apply those to people in another way? Do they have to reside within a, a physical space that is hotly right. contested by other people? Mm. You know, obviously the technologies that we're all a part of in terms of delivering offer the opportunity to, to change the way we live, work and play. We talk about it all the time. So you can address that affordability issue through those mechanisms and why not? Right. And so for a place like Singapore that's already fairly advanced, what is motivating the government? And it doesn't have to be Singapore. We're here, so it can be a little bit touchy. But other governments that are, are you know, relatively advanced, they're, you know, people, I mean, in New York, they're just putting Wi-Fi in subways, which is unbelievable, but now I'm happy. And so what would motivate the government to continue to take on the cost of continuously innovating? Because an innovative city, it can't be stagnant. You know, you have to continuously implement new creation. So, how do you convince a government to take on the cost of implementing new technology, and what is, why do they want to? Well, well let me, uh, I, I, a, a fellow, a sister city of yours is Madrid, which I would share an example where it actually is a city that's investing in this to, to take money out mm -hmm. uh, and improve service at the same time. Uh, and it, it's, it's about uh, city services that are contracted typically on contract for uh, uh, tree trimming, waste collection, right. city cleaning, and they're paid on, uh, on contractual uh, uh, programs. And by turning it around and paying them on service levels, uh, they're going to take a billion dollars out of the city budget each year. Mm. Uh, and that's a huge amount of money. Yeah. And, and what they're doing is you know, taking Internet of Things and sensing, uh, taking citizen engagement and, and using that, as well as uh, mobile inspectors with KPIs, fusing uh, you know, inspector insights on service quality, citizens' views, and sensed views mm -hmm. into a service level that uh, you know uh, they pay based on outcome. Yeah. Now you know, and, and then you look at well, you know, I thought there was a question before on waste management uh, in the previous panel, and you know that's one of the examples where you sense the container and you pick it up only when it's full. Right. Now the garbage company uh, may not on volume, you know, uh, no pun intended, but you know uh, on revenue, uh, not pick it up as often. Uh, and, and maybe their revenues are down, but their profits are up because they're only going in when, the, when it needs to right, be collected. Right, right. And they're, they're happier in, in Madrid as well. So it is citizens getting more value, the, the suppliers getting you know, more engaged in, in, uh, in, in what they do, mm -hmm. and then the city saving a billion dollars. Great, and so there's actually a question I think that you can answer um, from the audience. It says, cognitive tech like Watson or DeepMind, besides winning chess, Jeopardy, or Go, how can they be utilized to solve urban traffic challenges if applicable? Uh, well, that, <laughs> that's a great, we haven't <laughs> yet solved, you know, applied uh, Watson to, uh, to traffic yet. Right. But again, you know, the, the, the fundamental uh, thing that we try to address with something like Watson is the uh, marriage of structured and unstructured knowledge to be able to look at what people are saying, what text is read, mm -hmm. uh, and to qu query out all that dark, ins you know, dark data to, to draw out uh, I uh, insights uh, and, and to find tr trends. So what we can do is you know, look at uh, social sentiment, uh, look at uh, uh, inspector reports, look at uh, you know, fusing the weather data, and, and to have more insightful uh, recommendations based on you know, machine learning and so forth combined with systematic traffic right. systems. Uh, and I would you know, just put a plug in that there is a cognitive smart city project here in Singapore today where Watson is powering the Ask Jasmine avatar behind the tax agency IRAS oh, okay. uh, and, and MOM and, and citizens and, and personal tax questions have been asking, you know, even this last tax season, uh, questions through the avatar of all uh, public data on IRAS's website uh, and having Watson answer those questions. So it's kind of an example of cognitive systems helping improve citizen engagement. Definitely. And so we've talked a lot about transportation today. Are there any other sectors or industries where innovation is making the biggest impact across the board or in a particular city, whichever you guys can speak more to? Well, I do think that tourism, of course. I mean, yeah. it's uh, very hugely important. Uh, health, uh, e-government itself, uh, I mean, uh, nearly every sector can, uh, is being touched by technology and it's becoming smarter every day. It, uh, mainly not because 
uh, everyone believes in becoming smarter, but they right. need to become smarter to become competitive. Mm -hmm. And that brings me back to your question on why a city would bet yeah. on becoming a smart city. Uh, they need to be competitive enough in order to attract talent, to attract corporations, to attract investment. Uh, at the end of the day, a city is just like another uh, venture, yeah. let's say. And they are trying to position themselves uh, in order to attract all these values. Definitely. And so do you think competition plays a bigger role than many of the other goals? And so it's basically Singapore trying to, I think they're winning in a lot of ways, but competing with other major cities for tech talent and you know things like that. Well, I said before, we need to divide in different uh, needs. I mean, yeah. some uh, cities are competing among themselves. Others are just trying to solve very big issues that yeah. they have. So it's, uh, it depends. Right. I, I want to go back to your uh, previous yeah. question sure, about sure. Um, innovation. I want to move away from transportation, but it's still stuck in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> so um, very nice example. Um, so this is trying to solve the last mile problem which is being very heavily debated right now in Singapore. Yes. If uh, some of you are following it, we're talking about the uh, electric bikes or electric scooters. So uh, there's a startup uh, that's actually registered in Singapore and they're trying to solve the last mile problem. But the cool thing about innovation in that sense is um, because the access to technology, he is actually based in Hamburg. Um, he's got a guy who's um, giving the uh, electric battery for the scooter that's based in other part of Germany. Mm -hmm. He's got a manufacturer that's based in Indonesia. He's got an assembly guy that's based in Singapore. And this is, again, going back to convergence of innovation, technology, and the fact that it's a common problem that exists in Germany. It's a common problem that exists in Singapore, a common problem that exists in New York. Last my problem is across the board. But this is a perfect example about uh, going back to the point of technology where you don't need to be in one specific location, right? right? Being a smart nation, implementing that technology, whether it's networking or having access to cloud computing or mobility, you can actually sit in one location and have access to other potential vendors or partners in other regions and just implement a solution in multiple places. So again, going back to transportation, I couldn't right, find right. a better, <laughs> better example, but it's mobility and it's innovation across Seamless borders. Well, that's a good example, I guess. Yeah. Great. And so, I'm going to take another question from the audience now that we're here. Um, actually, so just leading off the point that we were talking about before, how do we bring? So there, there are cities that are trying to solve problems. And there, then there are cities that are trying to compete. And so, how do we bring cities in emerging countries to the level of competition, or somewhere close to the level of other more advanced cities? And how do we do that affordably? If there is a way to do that. Uh, my my premise is that, uh, and this is using a technology, but no, nonetheless, a, a cloud mm -hmm. is, in my belief, uh, if I you know I've been looking at the challenges of how to serve the 400 cities of uh, Indonesia and right. 400 plus cities of India, you know, there's a, you know, the constraints in smart cities is not a technology problem, it's a skills, it's uh, resources, it's, it's the capacity to apply it to a problem. And, and so the more we can uh, deliver these capacities as apps or uh, services off a of cloud, mm -hmm. you can start scaling it out. Uh, without dealing with the implementation challenges within a given city, which most cities in these two countries, for instance, uh, lack the capacity to do it well. Uh, and, and if we can give them water, traffic, safety systems that can be subscribed to, uh, that fuse maybe weather and social analytics, you know, video analytics, et cetera, into their local system, they can apply it. So we're starting to uh, do that in India, where we take a water system out of uh, Bangalore, and you know, water happens to be run at a state level uh, in India, so you can start serving it to the state mm -hmm. uh, and emergency management systems to a state. Uh, and so I, I, I believe that uh, you know, the transformation to uh, smart cities as a service is the means to scale it out to the places that can't afford the, yeah. you know, the resources to implement traditionally on-premise complex systems. Great. And so, I mean, what is the motivation for a private company to go into, let's say, a smaller city, maybe not, like the Gambia, for example. I know Ford is doing this pilot right now where they equip motorcycles with little chips that, and the Gambia doesn't have well-mapped roads or roads at all. And so, basically, they equip these motorcycles that are bringing people health care. 
um, and with these data trackers, and then that all that data gets pulled into this open data platform, and then now they're creating a map of the Gambia you know, and the roadways, which never existed before. And so this, the motivation for them, though, is, of course, gathering all this data for themselves. And so what is the motivation for a private company to go into a city like the, or a place like the Gambia to help a, a, a place that might not necessarily be able to afford the services that you guys provide? I think it's all about the scale, though. When, when you're talking about the developing world or not as developed world, um, their motivations are different as as my colleagues were saying here, you know, in, in Australia we're somewhat complacent. Our cities tend to work and tend to function very well. Mm -hmm. And we're not close enough to the rest of the world in a lot of ways, I think, to, to have that competitive pressure on our cities to develop in the same way that you get in, say, the US or Europe. Um, but in the developing world, they understand, as Tim was saying, that um, they can't follow the same development path that we did with the rapidly urbanizing populations. They just don't have the money, they don't have the resources, right. they don't have the skill base. So in order to do that, they're looking at these kind of technologies to leapfrog our development path. Now the opportunity for a private business in all of that is just the scale that you're talking about. If there's a number one issue around the world right now, it's, rapidly, it's rapid urbanization. Now more of us live in cities than at any other period in history. 50, more than 50% of the population now live in cities around the world. And that's growing dramatically over the coming you know, 15, 20 years. So the, the opportunities there may be minute in terms of profit margin, right. but huge in terms of scale for a private business. So you're offering your technology to a, a wider base of users. A much, much wider yeah. audience. And yeah. then you drive more, it's more about the experiential data rather than the actual, the money that you make. Yeah. Okay, great. And so I'm going to take a question now from the audience. Um, this one, I think, is pretty pertinent to everything that you guys cover, but urbanization makes living more convenient. However, overpopulation and planet sustainability are still pertinent problems. Are all urbanization strategies steering toward the same long-term goal? Nobody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, if you had followed COP, uh, you know, COP21 uh, in December, I mean, there are common challenges, I think, to some level, it, it is the same long-term goal. Um, I'll give you some stats. Um, according to UN, by 2050, there'll be 10 billion people on the planet. I like saying this because it's the same planet. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same planet and there's going to be 10 billion people. And, and going to your stats earlier, two-thirds of that population will be middle class. And guess where? China and India. Right. India is scheduled to overtake China as the most populous country in the next 20 years. 1.2 billion, I think. It's so the long-term strategy, I think, what we are heading towards is quite similar, yeah. Great, and so sorry to cut everyone short, but I think that we're done now. I really appreciate you guys taking the time. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.